Katabatash, Chris, and Katabatash to all the folks from Pine Woods. And it's a pleasure and an honor to be speaking with you all tonight and to be part of this wonderful series. Cha Wani Nakan Natasuis Jonathan James Perry Nutoma Sakonahana. Hello, my name is Jonathan James Perry, and I hail from the Aquina community of the Wampanoag Nation located on Naupe. Naupe is a small island located in the Atlantic seacoast, uh, just off of a place called Cape Cod, and uh, is nicknamed in more recent years, Martha's Vineyard. So if you've heard of that island, its true name is Naupe. It's been that since the ice is pulled back from the uh, Wisconsin ice sheet a long time ago, and our people uh, watched it become an island from the main from the mainland where it started. So um, I guess we get to name it first, right? I wanted to kind of immerse you a little bit. We have a saying for Northeastern native people and amongst Wampanoag people that you don't ask a question unless you're ready to hear the answer from the beginning. And to understand our people's reasoning for doing things, to understand who and what our people were and are, you kind of have to understand how our society functioned and what our world looked like. And so for Wampanoag people, we have been here on, on these lands on the northeastern part of Rhode Island and the southeastern uh, coastline of Massachusetts and in as far as if you know the area, the Blackstone Valley area, uh, going all the way up uh, towards the Boston area and uh, potentially even further at times. And our population was fairly large. So certainly not the population density that it is in, <laughs> in the North Shore or anything of that nature today. But ultimately, uh, you would be looking at 69 allied communities that made up the Wampanoag Nation and the average population per community ranged around 1,000 to two, maybe 3,000 people, depending. So our population was fairly large. And it makes sense because of the, the bounty of the sea and the rivers and the lakes and the forest and the fields here. The fact that we planted and we wild harvested a lot of plants and such, and we fished and we gathered and we hunted. So we're utilizing pretty much everything that you could. We're eating uh, a much more varied and rich diet than most, most Americans know or are aware of today. And, and ultimately that fed into why we tended to have a nice long life expectancy and were physically, you know, fairly capable people. Um, a good example of that would be uh, a 90 year old war leader that served uh, during King Philip's war, Metacomet's war in the 1670s. Uh, he was 90 years old and he ran from Mount Wachusett to Rehoboth, Massachusetts, fought and then ran back in the same day. That, that's pretty good for 90 years old. I have to say that that's impressive. Uh, I couldn't do that today. And I think a lot of people today would struggle with that. Uh, how do you get to be that physically capable and healthy? How do you have that kind of endurance? Well, a good diet is part of it. A lot, uh, a lot less stress than what we deal with today also helps quite a bit in, in being that physically capable, right? Uh, stress is a big issue for us in, in our health and our, our abilities today. But a, another big part of that, honestly, was you have far less work and far less uh, stressful endeavors to fill your day and a lot more time to play games and to play sports and to dance uh, with your community members and with visiting people or when you're traveling certainly uh, you're traveling to other native nations and you're interacting with people in their spaces and you're learning their dances and you're celebrating with them you're feasting with them and so you have a good diet you have a lot of uh, recreational activities that allow you to be uh, to to have a rich life and to be quite healthy. 
So that makes a very big difference in, in how you look at things and, and it makes a big difference in how, how uh, your health is on a, on a daily basis and throughout your life expectancy, right? And that's something that changed a great deal as a result of, of the changing systems that were brought here from other places and exposure to sicknesses, certainly taking their toll uh, and the loss of resources. And those things are actually, um, they, they, make a, they make up a bigger percentage of the changes in our health and our well-being than I think a lot of us realize, even just a slight change in diet. Uh, and I'll give you a quick example of that. When I traveled to the uh, state of Alaska and I interacted with Native people on the North Slope borough in uh, in places like uh, Barrow, Alaska, and Kaktovik Island, and some of those places, those villages, the people go out today, and they still hunt from the sea. So they hunt for wal walrus and seals and whales, because that's what they've done for thousands of years. And it's, it's the only way that they can feed their families. And anyone who bought a $12 gallon of milk in Barrow, Alaska knows what I, what I mean by it's the only way you can feed your family. Quite literally, you cannot afford to feed your family if you were just buying food that was flown up on little jump planes all the time. So I ate that whale meat and it was the first time I had ever had whale meat. Um, although I come from a culture that for thousands of years harvested whales from the sea, I had never I had never tried it because it was my, you know, my grandparents age, uh, family members that last hunted for whales and not even the, the tasty whales that our ancestors would, would eat, but, you know, some of the other whales for the whaling industry. And so I ate whale meat and it was 40 below zero. Uh, it was windy and I started to get hot. And, and was um, sweating a little bit. And all I wanted to do was go for a run. And my body just felt invigorated and, and just uh, coursing with energy because of the richness and the nourishment that that whale meat gave me. So you can imagine that even just dietary change can change your, your system and I'm predisposed to eating whale meat. I come from people who have done it for so long. And so when I read documents about the English or the Dutch or the French or the Spanish or the Portuguese people traveling through the area and observing native people dancing for hours or sometimes dances going for days, you start to realize, oh, well, with a good diet and a lot of free time, Absolutely. People could dance for days. People could do stomp dances for hours straight. People did snowshoe races and foot races. And they were able to do so because of, of a really healthy lifestyle, really good diet, right? Um, the average Wampanoag man could run pretty far, but they say the average Wampanoag woman could out distance a man in speed so we couldn't keep up with the women they were faster and it was said that an average Wampanoag woman could cover about 30 miles on foot in a day easily the average Wampanoag man could cover 60 to sometimes 80 miles on foot in a day at a slower speed that's pretty good so when people did stomp dancing, which is where the U.S. military started to uh, develop their cadence calling and marching uh, practice, uh, noting that the Northeastern Native people would march their troops single file, sometimes doing stomp dances for hours or even days straight, marching along so that no one would be able to count the feet and would be confused as to whether there were 20 fighters or 200 fighters. 
right? Which is why we went single file instead of marching wide so you could figure out how big the company of men was. And that everyone was in time with one leader singing out and everyone calling a response and people basically marching, creating a rhythm with their feet from their marching so that everyone was in step with one another and that they would not tire and they could go for many hours without stopping, only stopping to have a handful of cornmeal and a, and a mouthful of water from a spring or from their, from their drinking bottles to wash the corn down so that they had energy to keep going, right? And so those songs, those songs were sung oftentimes with rattles like these. This right here, this is a birch bark rattle filled with corn. And this is a this is a northeastern style rattle, uh, just a wooden handle, corn inside, and it just makes a nice sound. Right, and then you have these rattles here. These are uh, buffalo horn, so you have uh, different types of buffalo. Uh, some of the horn can be black, but you can actually shave it down to get some of the lighter colors inside. And so these, uh, they vary a bit. Some of them will have corn or like a lot of times people will put popcorn seeds in the rattles or BBs. BBs also have a nice sound to them. Beans, pebbles. So they have a different sound too. And you have different sizes. But a lot of times people would carry these rattles and then sometimes they would hang uh, copper or silver, uh, sometimes thimbles were a big trade item, right? Uh, so English or French or Dutch thimbles uh, would be pierced and made into little bells or uh, coins too. Native people would sometimes receive payment uh, for or gifts of money from royalty or from noblemen uh, for helping or assisting with things or for selling goods or furs. And Native people would take those coins and say, well, you know, its only value is the metal and the sound that it can make or the ornamentation that can be created from it because our people were not that interested in participating in a mon monetary system. We worked off of a barter and trade system. So, you know, established value based on not only the tangible, but intangible aspects of the items that you were that you were negotiating, right? So the value of something was much more than just its physical value. It was valuable because it came from Chris Jacobs and her story's interesting. And she came and she stayed with my family and she represents this other people, this other nation. She speaks a different language. And so suddenly that item is much more important. It's much more interesting. It has a much bigger meaning. And so those, those uh, oftentimes those coins would be drilled and strung and they would be tied around uh, your legs or hung in a series like decorative series on your uh, pouches or bags that you kept on your side where you kept your possessions in. And so when you danced, you would hear those thimbles or those coins jingling and they would also add to that sound so your feet are making the beat they're making the rhythm your clothing items are also making sound and rhythm and then instruments like a rattle that you carry with you would also add to that so you'd have this really beautiful sound of all of these people moving together and just doing things like call and response like yo yo Yo, oh, hey, yo, oh, hey, yo, oh, hey, yo, oh, hey, way ha, 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 hi, ya, hi, ya, hi, ya, hi, ya, 
like that, right? So you're answering back. Yo eh ya e yo we ye yo e 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 ya e yo we ye like that and so people would be uh calling out those those songs right uh one person would pretty pretty loudly uh announce and then everyone would answer back and they would go on and on people would march along for long distances and when you got tired when you needed a break you would break off and someone else would take that lead role and they would start to call out so you know you didn't have someone who just wore their voice out or you sang until you just couldn't sing anymore you'd take turns in it everyone would have songs they'd have their favorite series of songs songs they made songs that had been handed down through sometimes hundreds or thousands of years most of those songs and this is true of a lot of our dance songs a lot of our social songs especially in the northeast but really even nationally uh, for a lot of different tribal nations they oftentimes are vocable songs so a lot of times people will come up and they'll ask singers and dancers at powwows or gatherings or socials oh what are you saying what you know the, sometimes people call them chants or something like that and it's like no these are songs you know we don't really technically chant them and uh they're these songs are vocables because you may have people from multiple na native nations or nations in from other parts of the world even uh, who do not speak our language and so you can kind of get hung up when you're trying to dance or trying to participate in a gathering you can kind of get a little hung up on what's being sung how it's being sung and, and what's being said in those songs right and so as a result, a lot of our vocal songs or a lot of our social dance songs were vocal, I should say, because they they were meant to get people to to just enjoy and, and use their voices as uh, an instrument to to connect on a different level to dance without without worrying about uh, am I doing it right is it you know is this a, a the appropriate song they can just focus on the dances they can focus on the rhythm and they can enjoy themselves and so that that ultimately was the main focus of it so when you hear these songs a lot of times they're just vocables they're just like fa la 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 that's it and so you know so you just imagine people stomping along stomp 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 right to that beat one two one two one two right and you're going you know you might be going through the hills you might be going along the coastline and the beaches you uh, might be journeying a great distance to go to ceremony or you're maybe heading to a standoff with another native nation or you know you're going to the coast to see what all of these uh funny square ships are with all of these hairy people that were being called bears climbing on trees right <laughs> Humba jiba da humba yashka 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 yo yani 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 right so those are stomp dance songs and rattles really are important in our society they they seem to have uh they they're just they're they're so uh prevalent in every way they're used in ceremonies they're used in uh, weddings are used in uh, death ceremonies they're used uh, for children uh, to ground them and to remind them 
of uh, the first sounds of creation. They say when a child comes into creation, when the, when the child uh, first forms and as they're growing inside their mother, that sound as they come from the stars is that that's the sound of creation. And so that's one of the reasons they say that children love that sound, why children really take to rattles, and it's kind of their first instrument, is because it's reminding them of when the stars were forming them and when they were traveling to, to, uh, to hear, to, to form and live with the family and to share their gifts and to grow. And so you carry that, that rattle through your whole life because that reminds you that's that creation sound and that's the sound that sometimes you make your journey by right and you head back to the stars uh, with that same sound so it's a really important part of our society as are a lot of things uh, a lot of musical instruments and and music um, when the when the English uh, like um, when Edward Winslow and Miles Standish stayed in Massasoit's home. They talked about how they were kept up in the night. Uh, they were given space on the beds in the home. And they said, despite the fact that it was crowded, probably because they were just a number of, of they were two more people and a number of visitors staying uh with with massasoya and his family that evening um not because the house was typically crowded i'm sure like that uh but that they said there was very little room and then they said it was hard to fall asleep because everyone was singing so they said it was a very common thing to hear the native families men women child, children elders all singing sometimes singing quietly to themselves different songs so that there was just kind of a a really interesting sound uh that would form and i i wonder about that because uh i i wonder if people were singing off off tempo singing the same song off tempo and if they were harmonizing and if they were playing uh, with their with their voices a bit, as opposed to necessarily singing completely different songs, but it might have been something that was somewhat unfamiliar to to the English. Just like uh, when you listen to any of our songs, whether it's rattle songs or or water drum songs or powwow songs, our songs aren't sung to the beat. So you don't hear people singing like this, but our songs are independent from the beat and it's on a three beat uh kind of tempo system so it's it's off it's it's very very different from the um you know kind of the western concept of what music and music structure is and for a long time there was theories that native people just were oh, i hate the word and i don't like using it whatsoever but there was a, a concept that native people were primitive right and you hear that term and some people come from an older education system where a lot of native voice and you know true native knowledge wasn't permeating into the uh, in, into the actual lesson plans and so it was believed that oh it was just lesser developed societies but in actuality uh to be able to sing completely independently from from the 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 beat of a drum or, or rhythm sticks or different musical instruments is actually considered to be quite complex. It's very difficult. And so in actuality, uh, some of the native music performed in North Central and South America is actually considered to be some of the most advanced music on earth because, uh, because of the structure of it, which it's, I can say having uh, studied it heavily and saying, you know, since I was a child, it's very difficult getting the timing right and, and you know, get, getting the songs right and, and the beat right is, uh, is hard. And, uh, and then to add to that, that you start learning songs as a child when you're small and uh, you will learn songs after songs and more elders will come and share songs and you, and then people are writing songs too. And sometimes, when you were going to sing there's not a lot of time to learn these songs because there's so many 
And so there's times when there's ceremony or there's times when something important is happening or there's an honoring and you have to learn a family song for this honoring of this person. And so the singers will sit down and you, you sing a song maybe once or twice through with, with words in them, you know, a different, sometimes different native languages that you don't even speak. And you have to learn that song uh, once or twice through and sing it publicly very loud <laughs> with a whole group on B and get it and get it right and it's very difficult and i remember i remember this song it'll stick out in my mind to probably for the rest of my life but it's a cree song it has to do with you know bringing the people out and and getting them to dance and it, it's it's pretty complex and I just remember uh, this uh, Cree singer uh, wanted us to sing this song. And we were young. I was like maybe 11 or 12 years old, uh, along with some of my other singers on the drum. And he sat down. He said, okay, I'm going to teach you a song. I need, I need you guys to sing this song, right? And he started out. And it, and it sticks out in my mind because it was adrenaline. I just had <laughs> A lot of adrenaline. And it went Nitawa no wa che tapa che na kepa tapa tapa tanawa. Nitawa no wa che tapa che na kepa tapa tapa tanawa. And that's just the lead. That's just the beginning. So what we call the first and the second of the song. A wapama woke, a wapama ke, baskamo, so zoja ke me te, nesquahe, nabate, basamaso, so gabias and a way, a gapamas and a way, a heo, heo, heo. And then it and then it repeats through again. All nothing but Cree words. I don't speak Cree <laughs> at all, um, though I sing in it sometimes. And so we practiced it maybe two times through that song and then we had to sing it and it was just we sang it and it and it sounded really good and he was really happy um and it was to honor his dad and his and his family but it that's just kind of how it was so um anyway that was just uh a little a little tidbit so imagine uh just learning songs your whole life and having literally thousands of songs sometimes i can't think of one song because I, i'm thinking of too many of them there's like bits and pieces of all these songs and so i'm desperately trying to to find the right song so that's how how it is uh today just as it's always been for our people just having a, a huge amount of songs uh for all different occasions and you have your singers and those singers are held in very high regard because the singers are said to be the ones that carry the heartbeat of the society right so drums for instance like this one here this is a water drum so you can see there's a plug and a, a rim right here. And then this is deer skin, a tuck in our language. Uh, Papa Wanik is a drum, the thing that you hit repeatedly. And so you can hear the water in there. It's like a little bit of water. And the, the water drum has the water in it to create a different resonance, right? So it has a very hollow sound. It sounds really beautiful. And if you get a, mul uh, a number of these water drums being played in a lodge, it just has this really kind of beautiful, almost eerie sound to it. Just this really nice sound. And so these drums vary. This is a social dance style water drum. Here's another one. And you can see how it's hollow. You can see the plug. You can see the carvings on it. And uh, so that's that's basically what it was. Um, a lot of times, sometimes uh, a lot of times clay pots were used, too. So you have clay pot versions of this drum, the clay pots that native people use to make uh, beans. When you uh, put maple syrup and beans and spices and you buried it and baked them for a good day or so. Uh, I think uh, Nowadays, people mistakenly think that they were invented in Boston or something. They weren't. 
<laughs> they're an older bean, <laughs> an older bean recipe than than what folks think they are. So the water drums, these ones are social dance drums. These are traveling drums. They're small because they have a nice sound. They're pretty loud for what they are, but they travel well. So uh, unlike the bigger ceremonial ones that would stay put and be part of your community for ceremonies and things of that nature that they don't really travel. These ones here, you just empty the water out, pack them away, and just in your pack, in your pack basket, in your canoe, uh, with your sled dogs or whatever, um, you just travel with them. And, uh, and you can go a distance and just set them up wherever you're ready in camp or set them up when you get to the nations you're visiting and interact with them. So this is a moccasin dance song. dance for that that song is actually a lot like the charleston yeah uh, you have kind of this slide that you do um and so your your dancers dance it's a partner dance and then when the beat changes the dancers switch place and the lead dancer will fall back and the person the their partner comes up to the front and so they partner up like that and they're always switching in a long line of dancers dancing in a circle. And then, um, then another style of dance, um, another style of dance, a fish dance is really similar too, except the dancers kind of have that same shuffle dance to the uh, move that they do, but they face each other. So like when fish swim, and, and, you know, sometimes people call it uh, kiss, uh, kissing fish when the fish will be mouth to mouth and they kind of swim around, right? Sometimes it's courting and things like that. Uh, so fish dance, it's, it's the same. The pet partners will face each other and they dance really close to each other, right? And still do that shuffle dance. But these water drums, uh, they're, really, uh, they're really a nice sound. They're very unique to the Northeast. and uh, really important to us uh they're they're really um they're what we would call the heartbeat right so drums typically are viewed as and treated as the heartbeat of the nation they say the singers carry the heartbeat um and these these drums represent uh, our elders they represent our grandfathers so when you carry your drums you take really good care of them uh with water drums when you're done singing with them you drink the water because you're honoring that water, that water that gives life. You're singing and you're dancing with that water and you're doing things that are really important and that, that energy from your singing and your, your, your uh, event and the, all those really good feelings and all that communicating with all your people and all those dancers giving that energy back to the, to the singers. That's all 
resonating through that water. So it's it's important for the singers to drink that water down and uh, to thank it for its its gift and and to take that in to carry them to the next place, right? And also out of respect for water, because at the end of the day, water is life. Water's uh, the the point where life comes and life forms and life is dependent, right? So on that note, I'm gonna drink some water. It's really important always to hydrate too when you're singing. I don't know, you know, for anybody who's um, done a lot of singing, uh, a lot of times uh, they're trained, right? So we're trained to always drink water, room temperature water. Don't go for the icy cold stuff. It's bad for you. Um, so another type of, uh, another type of an instrument are these rhythm sticks, right? So these right here, these are birch, they're fire hardened, and they're oftentimes carved and designed, uh, but they have a nice sound, right? And so wood was oftentimes used as well, uh, not only as our drumsticks, but also as drums. So you have uh, rhythm sticks, and then you also have larger log drums, right? Uh, sometimes hollowed and shaped in certain ways. Uh, and so, you know, really trying to get that fire hardening to create a, a nice high pitched resonance out of the wood. So this, this is a Delaware stick dance song. Yo 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 we are ne yo 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 we are ne yo 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 we are ne ya we are he ya we are he yo 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 we are ne yo 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 we are ne yo 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 we are ne ya we are he ya we are he yo 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 we are ne yo 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 we are ne yo 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 we are ne ya we are he ya we are he yo 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 we are ne yo yo so those are just, that's just a sample you know and it's really hard to convey um it's really hard to convey how this all worked but think about this an average adult taking care of a family in my society years ago um, had two households. So that's one thing that you have to bear in mind. We had long houses, uh, bark covered houses set in pine and cedar forests out of the wind and uh, in typically somewhat sheltered valley spots because it was the uh, most secure and it was the most comfortable and you didn't have to deal with the high snow drifts and things of that nature so much. And usually you were a little bit pulled away from the large rivers, inlets and in the ocean because the dampness from, from that water makes it colder. And, you know, it's just tougher living. Anybody who knows New England in the winter knows uh, we have some pretty serious, serious weather. Um, and so you're in those longhouses and they can be upwards of a hundred feet long or more. Uh, I think some of the biggest ones ever recorded in the Northeast were close to 300 feet long. So it's a pretty big house and, uh, quite wide as well, quite high, uh, multiple sleeping, uh, levels on the houses and uh, large central open space with fireplaces. So sometimes as many as 10 fireplaces in the homes. And they were very warm and they were very comfortable and they were owned like all houses by the women. All right, we're matrilinear, matrilocal people. So women own the homes. Women are the ones who have and control the land and the men marry into the woman's line and become essentially a, almost like an adopted family member to the woman's line. Uh, but if there's, you know, divorce or something like that, the men can just they take, you know, they're basically, their possessions are bundled up by the family and they're sent on their way, right? Um, and that's kind of how it worked. So multiple generations of a woman's family line would be under the, that one roof, 
with all the men that married in and anyone who was adopted and, and you know, also visitors and whatnot as well. Uh, so you might have aunts and uh, cousins and grandma and even great grandma and all of the family from that line, your family and so on and so forth. So you could have 10, 11 families under one roof, but it's a huge roof and a great dance hall, really, uh, when, when you weren't uh, when you weren't doing your typical daily stuff. So you could basically separate, take the separating mats and, and, uh, you know, pack everything up and just make a dance hall out of your house and say, okay, everybody come over to our house at this time, we're going to have dances. And you would, you'd have basically your house that converts into an arena uh, a small arena where you might have uh, visiting tribal nations coming in the winter time and spending time there and dancing and feasting and people bringing gifts and you know all sorts of things happening. Those celebrations could last for days. And the reason for this is you have your winter house and you have your summer house and you have such a healthy environment and such a kind of a balanced system of growing and, and drying and smoking meats and, uh, you know, all your, all your dried, you know, your grown items, all your crops have all been like dried and stored away. Uh, and then you have berries and wild and nuts and things also that you've gathered and those are stored up. And you're doing ice fishing and things of that nature and, and winter hunting too. So you have a lot of food. Uh, it's said that an average adult taking care of a family in the summertime in our small summer homes by the water, by the, by the bays, by the rivers, uh, out fishing on canoes, growing your crops in your fields of about two to three acres per family, uh, per family uh, planting in a uh, companion crop system, the the uh, the three sisters plus you know melons and uh, and sunflowers and things of that nature, wild and uh, strawberries and different things of that nature. Uh, you would actually have about from a two to three acre field, you'd get five times the crop production against any modern farming method. So we, we had such an efficiency with our farming that you would get much greater yield because you were doing companion planting where the plants all supported one another. So corn, beans, squash are kind of the really well-known three sisters method, but it gets much more complex than that uh, for us here. So you have what ends up being a work day to maintain your home, wash your clothes, hunt, or fish in the, in the spring, summer, fall, uh, process foods, and, you know, take care of your children, educate them, play, dance, sing, you know, you've got all these things that you're doing. But work-wise, just to take care of your family, at the busiest time of year, it was said a Wampanoag adult would put in about a two to three, sometimes four hour work day. So imagine having to work a full four hours per day in this in the busiest time of year. I don't know. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> and then uh, and that's my maintaining two houses, don't forget. So not one, two houses. So then in the winter time, that dropped off to about an hour or two of work per day. So what did you do with the rest of your time? You danced, you sang you told stories, you gathered together and you theorized, you practiced your medicines and you created better medicines and you healed people and you, you know, gambled and you played sports and you did fun things and really entertained yourself for the most part. And so it was a really good system. And so because of that, your singers are really important. Um, there's an account from the French on uh, Nan, um, uh, no, Newport, Rhode Island in the Revolutionary War. And they said uh, the, the French were here. Uh, they had just allied and were helping to repel the English from, from uh, Rhode Island and had really started to bring their, their fleets and their, their arms to uh, the, the Revolutionary War and they said it was pretty boring in Newport 
until the native companies of soldiers came. And then they said that they had such entertainment because the singers and dancers would just bring out their drums and their instruments and they would play music along with incorporating mouth harps and fiddles into the music and they would play the traditional songs and their dancers would dance well into the night and they said all of the french soldiers all of the english soldiers or american you know uh revolutionary soldiers and all of the visiting people and, and government officials would all every single night uh, sit and, and, and be entertained and enjoy uh, the endless uh, music and dance and, and joy that the native people brought to the encampment. And then there's all these uh, really, you know, all, the, all of these sad moments where the where the native companies leave, they get, they get called away there. They have to go and respond to uh, attacks in other areas and repel the English and, and the newly arrived Hessian soldiers that the English hired because the native companies were too difficult to beat. <laughs> and so they outsourced to the Hessians. And uh, if you ever wanna read about that, look into the Stockbridge 71 and their battle with the 200 uh, Hessian mercenaries that were brought in to fight them. It's kind of an interesting story and a sad one, but but interesting. The Stockbridge Munsey, um, West Point Military Academy honors them every year for that. Actually, the first fighting elite of the United States. But the um, they said they they said that once the native companies left, it was very sad and very quiet, and no one was happy. <laughs> So I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to, I just realized we're, we're going on. I'm, I'm talking way too much, I apologize. But I'm gonna play this video for you. This is a, a powwow video and I want to share screen with you so that you can see this. This is a modern drum group. This is a style of singing that I've done uh, since I was, Why is that? And now it's not working. There we go. This is a style of singing that I started doing when I was about nine years old and then really got my drum group started um, at 11. And I've been singing with my drum group since the Iron River Singers. But here's uh, one of my favorites, the Northern Cree Singers. These guys are Cree and uh, amazing singers. And this song is pretty impressive. It's a special song, just gets a little harder and harder. Please all rise. Please everybody all rise. 
everybody take their hats off. Remove your hats and let you have to go for it. All right, I apologize. All right, I don't know so why it's still doing this. I've been over a year, man. I don't know why it won't stop, <laughs> but I, there, I stopped it. So uh, I just wanted to uh, talk about that a little bit. That that's a powwow style of singing, and that's a style that has come into this area, but uh, started out uh, amongst like the Crow people and the Cree people, and sort of the Plain Central uh, nations. And some of those uh, large styles of drums replaced these here, these hand drums. So this is a hand drum. This is an old old style rim drum. They have a nice sound. And so you have uh, like this right here. This is a, uh, uh, that scratch is kind of cool. It's actually really si similar to the, some of the scratching that Irish drummers do. So like that. So it would uh, like this a round dance song. Hey, uh, hey. That can go on and on for a bit, but it, that's a, a traditional round dance song. And um, people would dance in a circle there and they say that round dance beat, that's that heartbeat, one, two, one, two, like uh, the heart beating in your chest. And that really does represent the heartbeat of the people. And uh, yeah, so I, I know I could go on and on. I could actually talk on this uh, subject matter for uh, the rest of, uh, the night but i know we're limited for time and so i'll talk i'll just uh briefly at the end talk a little bit about my uh my flute and maybe play that as an out uh but at this point i'm going to turn it over uh to chris I, I know we have some question and answer period uh opportunity here and hopefully i didn't go too long i apologize thank you so much jonathan uh, i've loved just learning more and hearing uh I'm going to open it up to a question that you can ask Jonathan, uh, and you can do that uh, one of two ways. You can raise your hand um, using the reactions, uh, which is that little smiley face with a plus in there is a hand raise button, uh, or you can type a question in the chat feature, um, and we will ask the question for you. Um, so any questions out there? Um, I know I had a question, Jonathan, on the water drum. Um, is there a typical uh, type of wood uh, that that bass was made out of, or was it, you know, all different types of wood? Did they make different sounds based on the type of wood that you used? So, unfortunately, it's a kind of a sad story, but the you know, a lot of things are un affected, unfortunately, because of invasives in our society. So a lot of traditional arts and art forms are under threat because of lack of access or because things are actually becoming extinct. Unfortunately, water drums uh, require a wood that has a hooked grain. And the main tree that produces that is the American elm. So as a result, uh, making water drums the correct way is almost impossible now. I have only seen wild, healthy elm trees a couple of times in my life in this area. And unfortunately, at least a few times, the elms that I have found that, that survived the uh, Dutch elms disease lacks the hooking grain and splits. 
So because it's a wood that is that holds water and has to be you know carved out and shaped and and you don't want it to split, uh, it it's it's hard. <laughs> I can say uh, they don't last like they used to. That's actually an uh, an elm from uh, upstate New York. Thank you. Uh, so there are some questions coming in. And one of the questions uh, is, do singers typically also play instruments or do people specialize in one or the other or one instrument in particular? Oh, I think there's probably a lot of ways to answer. I mean, obviously uh, there's uh, like the hand drum work that I did and the water drum and the rattle work that I that I did to, uh, to show you some of our style. Those um, are simultaneously being used by the singers while um, while while singing, right? So uh, those instruments are designed to accompany a singer, but also you have people who are backing up. Some people might be, if I'm singing on a water drum, I might have uh, five or six singers who are backing me up and helping me sing songs, which is a much nicer sound and much more full than me sitting by myself singing to you like this. So I really encourage everyone to go out when when it's safe again and, and attend native, like really good native events. There's some really good ones. You can go to powwows.com for instance and find out about some of the gatherings across the continent uh, that are worth going to and, and enjoyable. Uh, but yeah, you know, you don't typically see people who are just working instruments alone. Uh, but there are there are instances where instruments are the only thing that are appropriate for certain times and vice versa. You have times when uh, acapella singing, just just singing and no beat, no drum, no rattles, no whistles, rhythm sticks, nothing uh, else is is going to be used. Uh, so there are times when you just sing there are times when you just drum or something like that but but honestly it's not uh it's not typical i would say usually it, it's pretty common for us to either sit around a big drum on a, like at a powwow on a, a a modern style of of gathering or uh or hand drums or water drums or things of that nature uh to keep the to keep the beat Uh, well, a question here is, um, what are the attributes of a really good singer and or dancer? <laughs> I think like, like anywhere at any time, there are people who just, they have that gift. They have a really good voice. They can really carry a tune. Uh, they can project well, uh, you know, I think there's actually well-known singing families in a lot of Native societies, but I don't think that's really unusual. I think there's there's really well-known singing families throughout the world. Uh, sometimes I think it just has to do with the gifts of your ancestors and the gifts through your family line and also how you're raised. My mother sang a lot and my aunts and my uncle were professional singers. Uh, a couple of them were, were classically trained opera singers. Singing and performing was kind of sort of typical in my, in my family, in my household. And uh, so, you know, for me, I just kind of, I focused more heavily on the traditional and contemporary native styles than some of the other, some of the other forms. But, but I've sang, um, I've sang many other styles in my life. I'm good at it. I can sing opera uh, pretty easily, actually, but it's just not my calling, I would say. <laughs> but I think, you know, we all have different views of that too, right? So when you hear someone's voice and it really resonates with you, it may not be someone else's favorite singer, but it might be your, your favorite singer. And you really go out of your way to hear this singer, hear their song. So you get that in our society too. There's some drum groups that are, you know, they're, they're just, they're the drum group. You have to hear, you have to go see. Um, and it's really funny because uh, you know, you'll see all the, 
uh, the crowd just go and like record them and and crowd around them at an event and uh you know and all the other singing groups will kind of get a little jealous like why are we getting the attention you know but it's like oh you guys have been singing for years everybody everybody's used to you (laughs) and they're new (laughs) lots of questions coming in um someone is curious about the release sound gesture gesture at the end of singing the i'm sorry release sound gesture at the end of singing I, I I think you're breaking up a little bit. I'm missing the word you're saying. <laughs> so I apologize. The something gesture. Relief sound. Can you hear me? Uh, no, you glit. Like I lose you every time you say it. Release sound. Release sound. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure I understand what that means. Like, like people calling out like, ah, like that. I'm not sure. Melanie, if you are on still and you can uh, ask what you mean. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so, so the, the, the song is, is high pitched a, a lot mm-hmm. of times and there's a, at a, a tremendous amount of energy. And then it seems like at the very end of the song, um, there's a descent in pitch and it's, and just this exhalation that doesn't happen anywhere, er, anywhere else in the song, but I, I really like it. It's, it just has this gesture of, of, I don't know what. So I just wondered if there was a meaning to w- the way these songs end. There, there is. So there's actually a pretty, uh, it's, it's somewhat of a complicated, complicated structure. Um, but there's, there's tiny, tiny indicators in each song, like there, the song repeats typically, usually, in, uh, unless there's a reason for it, you repeat the song uh, four times through, right? And you can find your place as a dancer you can figure out where you are in the song by these little indicators, slight beat pickups, uh, the absence or presence of what are called honor beats, which are like those hard hits, like at the second half of the song each time through. But if there's an absence of those honor beats, usually it's because of a, what are called a pickup where that, like that beat either hard one hit and then in an increased tempo or uh, a slight pickup right so when you pick up what those are called pickups you leave the honor beats out and the reason for that is uh partly to tell the dancers that you're on the third time through the song and it's going to end strong with a final time through the song lead second body honor beats and then end the dancers have to stop moving at that last beat if they overstep they lose the contest if they're dancing or or they basically the the singers beat them uh so there's like a little cat and mouse game that happens between singers and dancers where the singers are are beating a certain way and they try to figure out ways to trick the dancers so like extending it a little bit playing with the tempo just enough um like just all sorts of little games that we play uh to try to trick the dancers up and so the dancers like especially contest dancers they will study the music they will they will listen and they will study every song and every beat and every style so that when they're out dancing uh they can end right on time very interesting cool so yeah so those are all little tells little indicators to tell experienced dancers where they are and to be ready for that stop or be ready for a pickup or be ready for a tail which is when you end and then you start again and then you end. <laughs> All right. Uh, so another question that came in is uh, someone's wondering what you are doing the chanting type singing 
with the drum, what words are you singing and what do they mean? And can you give an example? I know that sometimes you said uh, multiple languages or multiple groups come together and they may not know each other's language, but then it does sound like there are some instances where there are words to the songs. So, I mean, there's, there's so many instances, there's so many languages, uh, there's, there's like the language families like Eastern Proto-Algonquian is part of the Algonquian family, the language family. So we're related to Ojibwe people and Cree people and Mi'kmaq people and Passamaquoddy people and uh, even Pamunkey people of Virginia and uh, uh, Lena Lenape people. Lena Lenape people or, or Delaware people, which are, you know, some of those folks are in Canada, some are in Oklahoma now, because uh, the Delaware were kind of pushed out of New Jersey, uh, New York area. But those are all language family people, but our languages are vastly different. Like if you listen to Wampanoag, and then you listen to Cree, and you listen to Ojibwe, uh, big differences, right? So uh, it's, it would be like comparing Portuguese to French to Italian, right? Um, you know, they're, they're, you see the similarities, you hear the similarities, you sometimes can pick up on words here and there if you know them, but they sound like different languages. And some languages are, are so different, like um, comparing um, Haudenosaunee or Iroquoian languages uh, Iroquoian people's uh, language to uh, Algonquian people's language would be like comparing um, Aborigine to uh, to Japanese, mm. right? Like totally different language family entirely, not recognizable between them. And so, uh, yeah, like some of the songs, some of the powwow songs might depend on on what it's used for like you know it can be as simple as uh this song is for the women to come out see the see our see the women dancing so gracefully uh they really are beautiful thank you women for giving life you know like it literally can say something like that or it can be our soldiers are home we thank them for their sacrifice we thank them for protecting us and we honor them at this time like you know it, it all depends on the language it all depends on the the reason for the songs and and uh and what the symbolism is a lot of them are interspersed with a lot of vocables so like you might hear um you might hear some words coming in and out of a song but a lot of the a lot of the especially contemporary power songs and big drum songs are are the majority of them are vocables and for those reasons that I talked about earlier, keeping it so that you can focus on dancing and having a good time. All right, so we have a final question. Uh, well, part of it is a question and then I'm just following up because we didn't touch upon it. Um, what is the protocol for non-Indigenous people performing and singing Indigenous songs? Can you just touch upon that a little bit and how can we honor and respect the song of our indigenous people here. Yeah, so that that's always a tough one, right? Because a lot of things have been taken in 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 this society, like in in the hundreds of years since colonization in various points in in, in our our lands, right? So whether you're talking about um, you know, people on the Northwest coast, like the, you know, some of the Russian folks and explorers and all that went into the Northwest or, you know, for the, uh, for the English and the French and the Spanish and the Dutch and the Portuguese here on the North New England coastline, or, you know, wherever you go. Oh, the story is a little different, but it's similar in that, you know, resources, our seeds were taken and those food crops helped to propel uh, cuisine and populations in all different corners of the of the globe. Our medicine knowledge uh, has helped to propel, uh, you know, 
societies to advance their 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 knowledge and their healthcare systems and even you know to create the the behemoth pharmaceutical companies you know today uh where it said uh you know it's actually known that 65 percent of modern pharmaceuticals are based out of north american native uh medicines and teachings so i mean that's that's a lot imagine if we had 65 percent of that <laughs> of the funds you know that came from that and so the the argument's kind of similar it's there's um appropriation that you have to be really be careful of right a lot of native societies are extremely guarded because so much has been taken without thank yous without uh any reciprocity without um any sort of compensation any sort of benefit so uh, it's kind of uh we've been uh, uh a people who have been collected off of a lot and really ultimately uh, suffered greatly for the losses without any benefit and without an ability to regain our strength and our, 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 our grounding to be able to have more um, control or say or to have a seat at the table to discuss, you know, what is or is not even appropriate. So I appreciate that question. I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in on it now. Um, ultimately, it's very difficult and it's kind of dangerous ground to take native songs because for for the instance that I, I said, uh, some of our songs have ceremonial context or meaning. Some of them are family songs that are specifically only supposed to be sung at a certain point by the family's request whose song own, you know, who owns the song. So we don't sing it unless the family comes and requests it and sometimes even teaches us to sing it. Uh, some songs have words and you could very easily disrespect not only the, the people you're singing to, but the people whose song, you know, it's intended for, right? Uh, so there's, it's really hard, I think, you know, you have to learn a lot. And ultimately, I would say your best bet is to to, to develop relationships and understanding and to gain knowledge about the songs and why they're used, you know, um, and then if you're gifted a song, if you're welcomed into the communities and you're welcomed into a situation where you have the opportunity to potentially uh, be given a song or given the rights to sing a song and why and go through that whole process, then maybe that's probably the best way to do so. You know, I don't think it has absolutely nothing to do with where you come from um, and what your ancestral background is, and more so the amount of time and dedication and teachings uh, that you have to go through in order to have the right to sing in the first place, right? Um, so it's, it's a very complex thing. Uh, I always suggest people support Native singing groups by, you know, CDs or or download uh, music from uh, different singing groups and performers. There's a lot of folks, you know, Joanne Shenandoah unfortunately has passed away, but she did a lot of uh, Eastern native music recordings, both in her contemporary singing style and traditional work with her community. Um, there are other ones like We All Sing, uh, Muskogee Creek uh, recordings of stomp dance songs and gathering songs. Um, there's powwow music that you can stream on powwows.com or you can download from uh, Young Spirit or Crazy Spirit Singers, Northern Cree, Black Lodge. Uh, you know, those are all powwow drum groups that are excellent drum groups. And, you know, go to Native events and, and develop that respect and that relationship and support indigenous cultures in continuing uh, there's, uh, their, their expression and their opportunities help to, uh, you know, potentially help to uh, encourage, you know, a university or other, of other organizations to, to put on native festivals and hire, you know, really well 
respected and i say well respected because there are you know there are hobbyist groups and, and boy scout groups and all that are out there um and you'll get a mixed um mixed response from native communities as to you know again it, it's kind of teeters on that appropriation and that that respect uh you know and so a lot of native singers a lot of native societies will uh you know are somewhat offended you know by having people go out and just listen to their music and play it not even understand what they're doing and not necessarily even do a good job of it or miss say words that, and you know they took something that was a wholesome song and they're saying the word wrong and so you know it's really insulting or something you know um so it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult place but you know ultimately there needs to be more opportunities for indigenous people to have space and have not only the economic opportunity but the community support you know like the the general population support for our people to feel comfortable and feel uh that it is appropriate and uh and good to share what we know and what we have um you know it'd be really It'd be really cool to have opportunities in Boston Common, for instance, for Native festivals and Native gatherings and, you know, for all of these different places, because no matter where you are on the continent, you're in, on Indigenous land. You can't set foot in a square, uh, a square foot of land anywhere here that wasn't populated and used for thousands of years by my or other Native people's ancestors. And so whether you're in Times Square, that's native people's land uh, going back for thousands of years. If you're in the desert uh, in California, the same. If you're in, you know, in the Arctic ices, uh, you know, by the North Pole, you're still an indigenous uh, space. And there are, are, you know, native cultures from those places. And there needs to be an embracing and a welcoming for indigenous people to have space in those places. So, you know, I think, I think as much as possible, I suggest people reach out and support and find ways to encourage, because ultimately at the end of the day, it's hard for us to provide enough opportunities and enough, you know, of a recognition of opportunity for people to express themselves to our younger generation. So these young people, some of them walk away from continuing on on this path because they don't see the respect and they don't see the space for it and you know with each generation it can become harder to ensure that there is a future you know that there'll still be language speakers that there'll still be people cooking traditional foods that there'll still be people gathering medicines and taking care of their communities or still running ceremonies or you know, still uh, singing or dancing some of the old styles, right? Because it's easier sometimes to walk away from it than it is to fight every single day for its space. Thank you so much um, for all that you've shared. And I'm sure many folks can uh, have lots of questions for you. Uh, what's the best way, if someone wants to reach out to you directly, what's the best way for them to um, ask questions, um, and so on and so forth, Jonathan. So, uh, if, if you'd like, you can share my, uh, website, uh, jonathanjamesperry.com. That is, you know, one way to reach me, uh, for, you know, future, uh, you know, for information or, you know, I'll, I'll help to guide you as best I can or, or provide you with some resources. Um, yeah, so uh, just be patient. <laughs> I get inundated quite a bit, and Chris knows quite well. <laughs> Sometimes it takes me a little while to get back uh, via email and whatnot, uh, just just because, um, yeah, it, it is the the nature of the world today. Uh, but I I you know always appreciate and and try to support as much as I can the opportunity for people to to learn and to understand indigenous people and to understand our continuance and recognize um, you know that we're all stewards in this we're all you know we we have to all uh, respect and stand together um, to move forward as as a society 
right? There, there's differences, but there's similarities and there's opportunity to celebrate our differences and to really enjoy each other's company. Uh, but you can't do that if, if you're not listening and if you're not engaging and you're not opening your hearts and minds. So, you know, I, I always encourage people to ask questions, to learn more, to connect to native communities and, and to, to be supportive. No. Well, thank you so much. Um, before we head off, just so we have one more um, uh, program in this Indigenous Arts and Culture, which is on Tuesday, March 15th. Both Jonathan and his wife, Leah, will be joining us. Uh, and the topic is Indigenous Connections to the Land and Building a Meaningful Land Acknowledgement. So again, that is uh, on March 15th. You do have to register for that one separately. Uh, I've put the link uh, in the chat section. And uh, if you enjoyed the program tonight, um, please consider making a donation. The link is also there. Uh, and then thank you as um, everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on March 15th. Have a great night. One in the can. Good night. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Chris, and everyone. Marnie, it's good to see everyone. And uh, hope everyone enjoyed it. It was fantastic, Jonathan. Really fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. Sorry, hey. I went over. Yeah. We're not Is it just sorry. us now? Is it just us or am I? No, there's still lots of people here. Everybody's here. <laughs> lots of hands and lots of thank yous in the chat. So um, people are really enjoying um, the program. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Good all right. Thank you all. And uh, I'll see you all again, hopefully, uh, sometime soon. And yeah, absolutely. Have a have a, a wonderful night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to log off now, folks, but thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.